Hello, everyone. Welcome to the encryption consulting webinar in partnership with Entrust. Today's webinar is on Protect Your Keys in a Digital World with David Wigman. Uh, we will begin at 10 a.m. CST time sharp. So uh, give it another uh, two minutes or so, and then we'll start. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the webinar, Protect Your Keys in a Digital World. Uh, my name is Kanisha Williams. I'm the Marketing Manager with Encryption Consulting. We also have with us David Wakeman, who is a presenter with Entrust, and we're going to hold for maybe another second. I see a couple people uh, joining in. So just give us another minute. And in the meantime, uh, just feel free to let us know where you're listening in from in the chat box. And we'll kick off uh, in another second or so. Okay, everyone, I think we're good to go now. Again, welcome to Protect Your Keys in a Digital, digital World. I want to thank everyone for joining, hoping you are all doing great. Again, my name is Kanisha Williams. I'm the Marketing Manager with Encryption Consulting. Today we have with us David Wakeman with Entrust. I just want to give a quick overview of encryption consulting before I do uh, hand it over to David. Uh, encryption Consulting is an established data protection consulting market leader. We focus on the areas of PKI, HSM, encryption, tokenization, and data masking. More than 100 corporations of the Fortune 500 have sought our help in protecting their sensitive data and solving the most complex problems. We are considered one of the leading leaders sorry, in consulting, planning, and advising of product selection. I'm now happy to introduce our speaker, David Wakeman, who is a technical sales consulting, sales consultant, sorry, and has been with the uh, interest for seven years. David's an accomplished sales management professional and sales engineer with over 20 years of experience in data, 
telecommunications industry and cybersecurity solutions. A solid track record of exceeding sales quotas, analyzing and building relationships with customers and channel partners and serving as the technical liaison for clients. His areas of expertise include cybersecurity, sales management, and cloud deployment, BYOK and MYOK, customer service training, networking, management, and communication. Now, before I do hand it over to David, please be sure to share your questions in the Q&A bar. And um, if you have any questions that do come up throughout the presentation, and we'll take them up uh, at the end there. Uh, and now I will definitely hand it over to David for his uh, webinar. David, over to you. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, this is David Wakeman, and I um, want to talk to you today a little bit about uh, protecting your keys in our digital world. So before we get started, I'm going to do a little mini commercial like you see when you go to the movies uh, about our uh, about Entrust. So Entrust is a um, is a company. OK, come on, show up. Hmm. All right, there we go. Why is it not showing? Interesting. Give me just a second here. There we go. There we go. Okay. There we go. All right. So it just didn't want to work right. But uh, Entrust has been in business for over 50 years now. We started off in the uh, data card uh, technology and have grown over the years. Um, we are now over 2,500 employees worldwide, um, approaching a billion dollars in revenue. And we have well over a thousand technology and channel partners. Um, and you can see all the different industries we, uh, we are participating in. Anything from, again, from payments all the way through to identity uh, and everything in between. So today we're gonna to talk about specifically about the digital world and about um, your keys. So I wanna go through the definitions first of uh, encryption and cryptography. And so we know that encryption is converting uh, clear text to uh, hieroglyphics, as I like to call it, basically convert information or data uh, into code so that it cannot be read without uh, pro proper authorization. And of course, cryptography is the art of writing and solving codes, which gives us the ability to do both encrypt and decrypt. Um, the uh, state of encryption in our world today is uh, quite interesting. Uh, the uh, picture on the, on the right kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at. Most security professionals uh, can't explain the difference between symmetric and asymmetric uh, encryption, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, definitely something you need to understand. Um, they trust without question that encryption is securing their data. Um, and they believe that it's, it's possible to protect their data by making their perimeters more secure, which as we go through it, you'll find that uh, that really isn't the case. Um, and most executive management don't trust encryption. They're afraid of it. And the reason they're afraid of it is they really have a lack of knowledge. They don't understand what uh, encryption is really all about. So it gives them, so it makes it a little bit difficult to, to engage with them at, at times and trying to get them understand how important encryption really is in their environment. Um, and let me give you a little bit of history of encryption. So about 2000 BC was when the first encryption was ever created and it was created by Egyptians. Basically it was a cipher trust or a substitution trust, uh, uh, su substitution cipher, excuse me. Uh, and it was very simple, very, very simple for the times, but it worked. Uh, basically it was where semantic encryption was born. So um, there was a simple key involved uh, and both parties, the, the sending party and the receiving party had to know that key. And that key was something very simple. All they did was shift their alphabet three letters to the right. And as you can see, when we do that with our alphabet, it changes everything. And so unless you know that that's what the encryption key was, trying to interpret it was a little bit difficult. Do you remember the uh, Christmas story? and that, uh, the, that uh, decoder ring that uh, he got in, it for, in his Christmas uh, uh, stuff. Well, that was a symmetric encryption key. Uh, basically, there was a, a combination of things that you use 
to create coded messages so that only the people that understood that and had a similar uh, device could could uh, read those those um, messages. And a lot of substitution ciphers have come in over the years. And the one on the right here is actually Morse code. And um, so uh, Morse code has been used by the military by you know, for years and years and years. And you needed to understand how to encrypt uh, and how to decrypt that data. It was very easy to implement, but it was also very easy to crack. And then one of the things that makes these types of encryption substitution ciphers um, very easy to crack is the fact that in the English language, we have a lot of small two word, uh, two letter words, such as two, uh, and it, or et cetera, and so on. And because you can see that like the E is a, a, a quite a, a common character in the English language, as well as a T and an A, with all of these two letter words, it would be very, become very easy to uh, break that code and, and be able to read those, uh, those uh, encrypted uh, messages once you understood that. So again, Morse code is technically a substitution cipher because we're using uh, that dashes and dots for that. And the thing about these types of ciphers is it doesn't have to necessarily be uh, character for character. It can be, you know, characters and numbers, and or in the case of a Morse code, it can be dash, dashes and dots. Um, but once you understand that's how things are being done, it becomes quite easy to break those uh, those codes. So some of the other early encryption methods were the Skytail cipher, and this is where you had basically, you know, some leather with different letters on it. Uh, and you had to have the right key in order to uh, be able to read that, that cipher, as you can see in the picture. So what was the key in this case? The key was the diameter of the stick. And how was that, how was that key protected? Well, you always thought that that was just a swagger stick, right? But in reality, the officer in the field would carry that stick, and when he received those messages, he could wrap it around his uh, stick and be able to read what the message was going to, what the message was that was being sent to him. So during World War II, the, the Nazis, the Germans, came up with a, a, the Enigma machine. And it was, a, it was very difficult for the Americans to break it, the Allies to break it, um, because there was uh, some things involved. The, the key uh, was the rotors and the position of the rotors. So unless you had a, a copy of the Enigma machine, breaking that code was very difficult. Um, but some very intelligent and uh, geniuses created what we call Turing's uh, Tome. And this was actually arguably the first programmable computer. They actually were able to create this device that were able to de decipher uh, and, and determine what rotators had to be set, what the rotators had to be set in order to be able to break the code and read it. And once they designed this machine and got it working, the, the, the entire war changed because we now knew what the Germans and the, and the uh, Axis uh, countries were doing, uh, even though they didn't know that we had broken the code. So the same period of time during World War II, the United States needed to have a way of passing uh, intelligence to the field without it being um, caught, without it being uh, you know, able to be deciphered. And so the Navajo language was what they ended up determining was the best way to do this. Have you ever heard of the expression security by obscurity? Well, the, the Navajo language was so obscure that you know, only a small group of people, the Navajo Indians, were the ones that actually understood that language. So what was the key? It was a Navajo Indian. The scary thing was, is that you know, given enough time, however, it could have been and would have been cracked. And so with the Navajo Indians out in the field with the different uh, divisions and, and uh, battalions and whatnot, the, um, the troops were told that if the Navajo Indian 
had the possibility of being captured, they were to kill him so that he couldn't really, you know, he couldn't uh, give up the code. And if the Navajo Indian was captured, he was instructed to commit suicide so that they could not learn the code. I really wouldn't have wanted to been that person. I don't, <laughs> I don't think we would, anyone would have, right? So the Rosetta Stone was probably the most important key ever discovered. And the reason why was at the top was e Egyptian hieroglyphics. In the middle was Demotic uh, code um, writing. And at the bottom was Greek. So between being able to see that the same information was written in three different languages, um, historians were able to then break down and understand the different languages and then go ahead and um, go back and understand what was being said uh, in all of the different uh, scrolls and things of that nature that they had found from biblical times. Um, and this key, key remained secret for over a thousand years. It was actually buried um, in a, I believe it was a farmer or, or an excavation that actually found this stone and then brought it to light so that the, that information was then be, that they were able to then start to understand what was being written in a lot of the scrolls that they had found el elsewhere. So this is another interesting one. Uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, um, had a problem with Queen Elizabeth. And, Queen, and he, she was sending messages back and forth to assassins she had hired to kill Queen Elizabeth. But Queen Elizabeth found the coded messages, but she couldn't, she couldn't find how to um, interpret them. So she didn't have a key, but eventually she did find it. And guess what? Mary Queen of Scots, of course, was executed. Uh, they actually chopped off her head. So I wouldn't have wanted to have been her. But now th the question is, is um, the key was very important. And so you have to ask yourself, what was more important? The messages that were sent or the key that, that protected those messages? And I, obviously it would have been the key that protected those messages because without the key, the messages never would have been interpreted. And so she never would, Queen Mary, um, or Queen Elizabeth never would have found out what was being passed back and forth. Now let's move into the 1970s. And of course, computers started taking off. We started you know, making them smaller, more powerful and things of that nature. And so we had to find a way um, to be able to uh, encrypt data being used on those devices. And so the NSA developed data encryption standard, which is DES. Um, and we've, of course, grown from that. But that was, a, that was one of the first computer-generated or computer-created uh, symmetric keys, uh, algorithms, um, that existed as we started to grow forward in the 70s. Now, um, there was a problem, though, because how do you distribute that key? Um, and it, that needed to be solved. So. Um, you probably uh, have heard of uh, Whitfield Diffie, if not, and Martin Hellman. They were the ones who actually created the uh, symmetric encryption key exchange, and it was born in 1975. So they had a way of being able to exchange those symmetric keys because a symmetric key by nature is a one-to-one -one ratio. And so whoever's sending it uh, uses the same key as the person that's receiving it. So AES, uh, DES, and triple DES are all common symmetric encryption algorithms. So let's, let's talk about uh, Alice and Bob um, in this scenario. So Alice places a key inside of a box. She locks it, uh, her, the box with her key and lock. And she sends it over to Bob. Now Bob wants to get that key. So what Bob does is Bob applies his lock with his key to the box. And now the box has two, two locks. He turns around and he sends it back to Alice. Now, of course, now Alice takes her lock off with her key and returns it back to Bob. So now Bob uh, has the ability to unlock his lock and open the box. And now he has the key that Alice was trying to get to him. 
seems pretty simple, right? But it is a lot more complex than that. And so, um, unfortunately, uh, Diffie Hellman uh, was not. It was not that simple. So, when you look at symmetric encryption uh, using modular uh, arithmetic, where nine plus eight equals five, we're actually talking about base twelve, mod twelve. Because if you take nine and nine and eight, that's seventeen minus twelve equals five. So that's that's how that symmetric encryption would work. Um, but um, symmetric encryption uses random numbers, so a C value ha has to be um, created before the key can be exchanged. And the stronger that random number, of course, the stronger in the encryption. Um, and just Remember that no matter how complicated the process is, it, it's the key, the protection of the key that's important. So it doesn't matter, so long as you protect the key, um, whatever, whatever you're using is, is um, the, the thing that you, you have to be aware of and make sure that it's um, complicated enough to be able to protect the key. Now, uh, symmetric encryption, of course, uh, has one major weakness. And again, that's because the sender and receiver need to use the same key. And what do you do when you don't know the other end? You, you, you want to exchange information with somebody, but you don't necessarily have the ability to just share that key um, easily. So what do you do? Well, you had to come up with um, a way of being able to share that information or that key um, with the other end in order to make sure that you could pass data that couldn't be interpreted. And so uh, Whitfield Diffie thought and, and realized that there had to be a, a way of creating a public and a private key so that there could be the exchange process like we talked with Sally and Bob um, that could happen um, in enabling us to be able to pass that symmetric key to the other party, even though we weren't closely related or didn't have the ability to do it. And that's where Rivest, Shamir, and Adelman came in and they created RSA, their first, their, their initials of their last name. Uh, and they, they are friends and they created the asymmetric encryption uh, ex key exchange. And that was born in 1977. So that gave us the ability to now be able to use symmetric encryption uh, and use asymmetric encryption to be able to pass a key, a symmetric key from end to end without it being uh, exposed or compromised. So with asymmetric uh, uh, encryption algorithms, uh, they are much larger and, and more complex than um, a symmetric uh, uh, key. Um, they're a one-way cipher. So the person that's sending it uses the private key and the person that receiving you is going to be using the public key um, in order to do this. So what happens is it allows uh, entities that don't know each other or don't have a formal relationship to be able to exchange the more important key, which is the symmetric key. Um, and so um, what happens is the, the person that wants to have a communication stay with a, a website which is something we all use now. He would send a request to the to the website from his device, and he would be sending out the uh, website's public key with that request. The um, and 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 everything, and the website would receive that, and then go ahead and respond back with information that would allow them to be able to share um, the, the the symmetric key. Um, when the handshake is completed. And it, of course, an asymmetric requires a larger key size than symmetric encryption. So for example, AES 128-bit uh, symmetric key is equal to a 3072-bit RSA key. So the, using an asymmetric key for everything was not, um, was not efficient. And so, but it was good to be able to be able to pass that symmetric key. So, so then the, the transmission, the communications were done in a, a smaller package and, and much more efficiently. So asymmetric encryption, uh, of course, was slower than symmetric encryption and it required a lot more processing power. So what's next? As computers get faster, encryption will, will, keep, will need to keep up, right? So 
we're looking at right now at quantum encryption. The, 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 the key things that we're looking at right now is, is uh, quantum computing and how that's going to infect, affect our world in the next five to 10 years. And of course that has to do with quantum encryption. So we have to be prepared and create algorithms that cannot be broken uh, in a, in a post-quantum environment. Um, and probably at some point, we'll probably end up going to photon encryption and then uh, quark encryption. And of course, finally, Dweezeldac encryption. But of course, I made that one up. But as you can see, as, as computers improve and, and progress and become more powerful and more uh, functional, um, we will have to adjust and adapt our encryption capabilities to meet the needs of our, of, of our world to ensure that our data uh, is secure uh, in, in our world as it grows. In the end, it really doesn't matter. Uh, if you believe that anyone can, can crack an AES 256-bit encryption by brute force attack, that's just a fallacy. And, and uh, give you an idea, there are 1.15 times 10 to the 77th combinations of, of numbers or keys that could be created in an AES 256-bit encryption. And this is what it would actually look like. So the idea of being able to break that with, with a computer right now in today's world is just, it would take millions of years. Now, there you go, Quant, uh, more, more years than we, can, than we can imagine. But with quantum computing, that will change. And so what we're seeing uh, happen now in our world is we're preparing our company as well as so many others are preparing for the inevitable where quantum encryption will be able to break that key in a matter of uh, maybe hours or maybe even less, depending on how fast that advances. So companies are already starting to address how do we, how do we beat quantum uh, encryption? How do we beat quantum computing now so that the data that we're, we're encrypting today can't be uh, de decrypted in the years to come? And so we're seeing that happen in our world as we speak. And the, the you know, of course, the, the current time to, uh, to brute force is millions of years. Um, and so that takes an incredible amount of computing power. But again, when we get to quantum computing, that all changes. And as if you've watched any movies on TV where they sit down and in 30 seconds, you know, with a gun to their head, they break that key. That's just not, that's just not real. And of course, Hollywood loves to play it that way. Um, so the truth about modern encryption, no one in their right mind is really gonna break a key. They're not gonna even try, okay? You only have one solution and one option and that's to steal the key. So um, encryption keys get larger and computers get more powerful. The only thing that will matter is protecting the key, right? So that's where a hardware security module comes into play. It's specifically designed to protect cryptographic keys. It, it, you lock keys down in a hardened device so that nobody can access that key except the authorized applications. And how does that work? Well, in our current world with applications, all kinds of different applications are using encryption these days, right? So when you're using a, a software environment, you can see the keys are everywhere. They're in the application operating system, in memory, in storage, uh, in backups, and every place else. So you lose track of where those keys actually exist. And so it becomes very easy to lose track of, of where they are. And guess what? When you put them inside of an HSM, the keys are only in one location, and that's inside the HSM itself. And all of the software that needs to use those keys calls out to the HSM to be able to utilize the key um, for the purposes they need for the application they're running. And so you never have to worry about that key getting lost or, or getting exposed. Now, the average time it will take a, a hacker to penetrate um, is about 160 days. And it actually is, it can be longer than that, but that's the average is 160 days. How much damage do you think a hacker team can do if they penetrate your network um, and they're not detected for 160 days. Um, and what, what's, what's realistic is, is that um, they can get in, do all, do, do all the retrieval they need to, 
and uh, bring it back and get out before you ever realize they were there in the first place. That's scary. And software can't generate a true random number uh, it just by the nature of the beast. And that's what makes keys that are generated by software devices uh, vulnerable. So HSMs have a, 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 a number generator, a hardware number generated built into them. So the, the random numbers that they generate are very secure and very complex, uh, which outperform software. So you get a much more random environment for the generation of your keys um, with, with the random number generator that's inside the HSM. Uh, and, and believe it or not, not all random numbers are, are, aren't random. Uh, and when you when you get into software, you'll find that you'll find that keys get repeated uh, because of the nature that they can't generate that random number as well as a hardened number generator does. So mostly keys in that environment are stored in software and they aren't hard to find. This is a block of five uh, of five chunks of data inside of a, a memory. The memory was frozen and they pulled out these five blocks of information. Um, and one of them is, a, is, a, um, is an encryption key. And the nature, consider that a, a, a key is generated, is created with a random number, which means that it's gonna be very, uh, very random. It's not gonna have any patterns to it. So um, as I'll show you in a second, It'll be very easy for you to spot this key. And if you want uh, to post it in the uh, in the comments, uh, Kanisha can can uh, you know respond to that. So if you want to go ahead, but okay. So again, these are the five blocks. And one of them is an encryption key. Does anybody want to uh, post post a comment and and tell us your guess on which one it is? Kanisha. Yeah, I'm looking in the chat box to see if there's any answers coming okay. in. So everyone, if you have the answer, feel free to uh, share it in the chat box. And don't be shy. <laughs> I see a couple of answers see, coming in. This one said four. It's number three, the one in the middle. If it's it's almost like white noise because it's so random in in, um, in its creation. Um, but you can see when you when you realize that that's what you're looking for is something very random. It's very easy to spot the key, and hackers are are uh, trained to understand how to find those keys, um, and so. You you could if if I had given you a little more information, you probably would have found that key in about you know thirty seconds. Which is what when I'm when I'm on, on site with customers, that's about how long it takes before two or three people will tell me that they think that that is the uh, the the key itself. So the lack of pattern is also often a sign of a key. So if it's that easy to spot it, then um, a hacker getting in around your perimeter understands how to find the key and also understands how to search out the data. If they're in your network for 160 days without you knowing about it, what do you think happens? They've taken your data, they found your keys, and then they backed out and you don't even realize it. And they'll, they won't use it against the company right away. They'll wait until the, 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 the right time um, so, that they, so that they aren't discovered right away. And then, and then they'll use it against those companies, whatever it may be, whether it be, you know, holding them ransom, whether it be distributing the data out on the open web or passing it on the dark web, um, they will find a use for it at some point in time and then apply it. So again, um, it, it, it is so vulnerable when your keys are in software and not in hardware. So what do you think all of these companies may have in common? They're, they're big companies. You've probably heard of quite a few of them. Uh, and it, you'll, it's scary, but every one of them have been involved in a breach and the hackers bypass their perimeter. The perimeter is no longer the, um, the, the best way to protect your data. 
And they said that, um, that um, through a, a research by 451 uh, Research, that 87% of the budget that companies spend uh, on, um, on security is all on perimeter security. And that's, and that's uh, you know, that's because of our DNA, okay? Because for so long, over 5,000 years, we've built walls around everything from, from ancient times till, to even up to now, we build walls and, and safes and things like that around the things we're trying to protect. So, you know, so uh, we've protected our assets like that for thousands of years. They've been physical. So it made sense. Build walls, build safes, build things that are impenetrable. So because of the physical nature of the what we were trying to protect. Well, now we're in a, a uh, assets are intangible. They're digital now, and that's only been going on for about the last seventy years. So it, our world is changing, but yet our DNA is still looking at it from the standpoint of all the years past where everything was physical. So um, only, um, only about 1% of our recorded history has been in the, in the, spent in our digital age. So, so it's understandable why it's taking us time to recognize that, that we need to make changes in the way we protect um, our assets at this point in time. So we need to reprogram our DNA. And it's probably going to take a few more years before that happens. Although we are seeing a huge trend in, change in that, especially because of COVID and what COVID uh, did to our to our world and how uh, the way we worked had to change because we were used to going to offices and 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 working in large offices. Well, now so many people are now working remotely or have part you know working part time remotely. So all of these things had to change, and of course that has sped up the change in what we're seeing. Um, with going uh, more digital and, and uh, the things that happen because of that. So we are seeing this change happen more rapidly than maybe we would have seen three years ago. So let me put it another way. If a burglar wants to break into your house, they're not going to break a window. They're going to look for the key, okay? And what they're going to do is they're going to check first to see if the door is actually locked. And if it is, then they're going to search for the key. And we know that people will put keys under, uh, under welcome mats or in a fake rock or things like that. And the burglars know this too. So they will, they will search for the key, just like the hackers are going to search for the key in the applications once they've gotten into the network. They're going to search in memory and things of that nature. So it's the same, you know, it's a, a similar um, environment. But the, once the burglar has found your key, he's going to, um, of course, unlock the door. And if, if your keys uh, in your data centers are inside of software, it's the same, same scenario. You know, he's going to find those keys, and then he has the keys to the kingdom, so to speak. Once he has the keys, he can unlock, unlock the, the data. You can get inside your data environment, and uh, he has easy access to it. And a hacker doesn't necessarily, it's not one person for eight hours. They don't live in mommy and daddy's basement and, 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 and hack away in, the, in their um, PJs or whatever. Um, hackers work in teams and groups. And five hackers equals about three or more man years. 10 hackers equals about 10 point, or 6.5 man years. And 50 hackers is about 32 man years. So there's teams like this all over the world hacking and, and working as teams. Some are looking for the keys, some are looking for the data, and they work that way so that they can accomplish more in less time. And so, uh, and that only assumes, like, like it says, if, if the hackers are working on union time. So we all know that, you know, hackers are probably buried behind their computers for 10, 12 hours a day or more, um, just, you know, trying to bust through things and, and get in and do the things that they need to do and then get out. So um, once they've gotten in, they've got everything. They've, they've got your data. They, you know, they've got everything they need. And, uh, you know, so the burglar breaks in to get your, your you know, your possessions, your, your jewelry and all that stuff and money. Uh, but the hacker breaks in to get your corporate data. So um, where is encryption being used? Of course, in database, in file encryptions, uh, in digital signatures, 
uh, IoT devices use encryption now, uh, blockchain, digital payments, SSL, PKI, and the list goes on and on and on. Anything that you can think of in our world today uh, is using some type of encryption. Uh, and so that's what makes uh, things so important on protecting those encryption keys, because when they're not, then they can break into any and all of those things. So they all use a key. So in review, symmetric encryption is both the sender and receiver share the same key. It works only if both parties or, or systems know each other. Uh, getting both parties to agree on a key has always been a weak link. And then um, the strongest encryption, once the key has been safely exchanged, you can't break it. Symmetric encryption can't be broken once the two parties have the same key. So with asymmetric encryption, you know, the key is used to encrypt, one key is used to encrypt the data and a different key is used to decrypt the data. Um, and it's, it's used if you don't know the other part of your system, it's used to pass the symmetric key. Um, uh, it's used, uh, it uses a longer key length um, than a symmetric key, which means it uses more processing power, it's slower than symmetric, and so uh, it, it creates complications in the world, in our digital world, I should say. So um, perimeter, corporate perimeters are, are, not, are, not too are not all that complicated, uh, and they can't be secured. You know, something as simple as um, not reconfiguring a password on a router or uh, things of that nature uh, are easy to find. Uh, we see continuous phishing uh, attempts uh, in corporations now, and phishing has become a big thing. You know, you see, you know, it's not like they're offering you the, the gazillion dollars from Nigeria and all and the Nigerian prints and all that stuff anymore. But it, but they they have learned to be able to mask emails to look like emails that you would take for granted as being a valid email. And, and, and all it takes is for you to click that link or open that document. And now they've, now they've uh, penetrated your network and you're off, off and running to do what they need to. So focusing uh, um, on, you know, when you focus securing your data and verifying authentication, it's much more effective. So you've got to keep track of those things. Um, so that you make sure that those things don't happen. And, and more and more, we're seeing more and more of that where all of, the, all of this stuff is being tested by companies uh, all over the place to try and make sure that they educate their employees on the, the uh, dangers of it. So we've got to stop relying on walls. Uh, we need to program, reprogram our DNA. Uh, we need to come up with more modern uh, encryption solutions that can't, uh, that can't be broken. That, uh, hacking techniques uh, can't use to um, um, to decrypt our data, and we and we got to quit believing Hollywood. Um, and um, uh, the, you know, we know that the hacker's only option is to steal the key. So don't leave your keys under the mat at home or at work, and protect your keys at all costs. And don't let this happen to you. Well, that's it, folks. Please, uh, questions, um, comments, um, Kanisha will see them and we'll be happy to answer anything. And again, Kanisha is with Encryption Consulting, one of our partners, and I'm uh, David with Entrust. Uh, and I work with our channel, our channel partners, uh, as well as our account managers um, from a technical sales standpoint. Thank you so much, David. This has been uh, great and I, I do see a lot of engagement going on in the chat there. I want to, um, you know, open the time now for some Q&A. So if anyone has questions, like, please go ahead and, and post them in the, the you can do the Q&A box, which is at the bottom panel there. You can also post your questions in the chat. I do see one question uh, that has come in, David, and I'll, I'll read it out and you can um, take a stab at it. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our attendees has asked, do you see any development concerning cloud-based photography? File-based? Yes. Okay. Um, well, file, file encryption is, is uh, very popular and we're seeing changes in the way it's being handled because uh, in years past, we used 
uh, simple uh, encryption methods that were part of the application like SQL and things of that nature, um, where the key was actually stored with the data. And so that is changing dramatically. Um, uh, companies are looking for better ways to secure that data. So we are seeing file, file encryption changing in the way it's handled. Um, and I think we'll continue to see that change. Thank you. Uh, I'll read another question. We have a couple that's coming in now. Uh, another one is, would you please share your approach in generating, distributing and protecting session keys in ad hoc digital swarms? That's a good, that's a good question. I mean, the, the only way to truly protect your keys is of course, to make sure you're using symmetric keys. But again, if you're, if you're, if you don't have a, uh, a one to one relationship or you, uh, and, and an easy way to pass that key or get the key to the other end um, without it being exposed, then, then the, the, the safest way to do that is to, of course, use a hardened device, a hardware security module of some sort um, uh, to ensure that your data, your keys are protected uh, so that your data can't be corrupted. Um, and a hardware, you know, in, in, in a world where you're using software keys, uh, man in the middle attacks are very common and easy, and, and easy to, um, to uh, have happen in a hardened, uh, device where you're storing your keys or protecting your keys in a hardened device that can never happen. So um, it, it really depends on what you're doing, how you know uh, in that in that regard. But you know the, the best the best solution is always to use some type of hardened hardware security module HSM to protect your keys. Thank you for that, uh, David. I'll read another one that I'm seeing here. Um, and this question is, I hope I'm getting it right. I've read about uh, homographic encryption and using Latisse-based keys. How it is used in real world, how is it used in real world now? Is it good to start implementing now? I'm sorry, I, let me, I, I'm gonna see if I can see that because I'm not sure. Um, let's see, I read about a, a homo, homomorphic encryption I'm using the latisse based keys. I, honestly, I don't see it being used right now in the real world. It, it's probably something that's being uh, reviewed and researched and maybe uh, development going going on, but I've seen no, no, no indication that that's actually being used in our world today. Thank you for that, David. Uh, I'm just wondering if anyone else has any other questions. Um, and feel free to also, okay, Lisa, thank you. Uh, feel free to also reach out, um, you know, via email, as you can see on the screen here, uh, David has added our, everyone's contact information. You can contact him there if you have to any other questions that, you know, does come in. I know sometimes that after the session, you're thinking, oh, I should have asked that question where our emails are always open. Um, to answer questions. Uh, I will say before we close, um, you know, the information that you've seen here will be emailed to you, of course, um, you know, so that you can have more in-depth knowledge of what happened here today. Um, also, just to make note, Encryption Consulting has launched its own online data community in Slack to foster networking and more information exchange. Uh, so uh, keep an eye out for that with the information that we'll be sending out in our email. We can continue conversations like this. Uh, David, I don't know if you have any other thoughts that you want to add before we close uh, today's session, which has been super great and informative, by the way. One, one th thing I'd like to add is, is we have so many companies that are now moving to the cloud and they're using the cloud providers key generation systems to generate their keys uh, and, then, and then encrypt and course and store their data in the cloud. There is, there is the potential there and I won't, I, you know, the, the cloud providers are good, good, uh, good companies, don't get me wrong. But there is the potential that if you're using their keys with your data, 
then they have access to that. And the, and the reason I bring that up is, is for some reason, a, a government entity comes or, or you know, attorneys representing somebody comes to one of these uh, cloud providers and says, hey, you know, we, we're subpoenaing the data for XYZ company and we want the encryption keys too. Um, that there's that possibility that that, that provider will turn over all of that information uh, and, and allow your company to be exposed, even though that wasn't the intention of you using them. So we offer a product that allows you to be able to, and, and, and Kanisha pointed this out in, in uh, my introduction, that we offer a product that, uh, that gives you the ability to manage uh, and bring your own key to cloud solutions. So if you've already started that migration to the cloud, you're using cloud provider encryption keys, we can provide you with, with a product and services that will allow you to be able to uh, bring those keys into the device, rotate them and, 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 and send keys back to the, uh, to the cloud provider. So now you control the keys versus the cloud provider controlling the keys. And we found that a lot of companies are looking at that because they, you know, they're, they're moving out of data centers because of the costs, but they also wanna make sure they're controlling their own data. So you may, if you're doing that as a company, you may wanna consider um, um, looking at a solution that will allow you to manage your keys uh, in that cloud environment. So it's just something that we've seen more and more of, and I think it's we're going to see even more of that. And honestly, some of the cloud providers are recommending it. They've, they're offering HSM services uh, in their solutions, but the cost is, is, from what I understand, the cost is prohibitive, that it can get more expensive than you know, owning your own uh, ability to manage your keys on your own versus... Um, Man, allowing use allowing the utilization of their services to do that. Um, we also offer uh, cloud a cloud solution for our HSMs, uh, and so you know if you're moving your data centers away, you're trying to get rid of data centers. We can we can help you with that as well as our our, our partners here. Uh, encryption services because they work with us uh, and we work with them closely. And so we can work together to be able to bring you a solution that will protect your data uh, and protect your keys, whether you're in on-prem or in the cloud. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, David. I uh, really appreciate that. And um, I do hope that everyone that attended today, you know, got to take something away from this. And I'll always remember, we are definitely here to support you. Uh, we will be following up with um, an email with, again, with all this information. So uh, please keep an eye out for that. Uh, and as well, we do have an upcoming webinar uh, next week. Um, so please um, also keep an eye out for that information. Uh, anyway, on, on that note, I will uh, definitely tell you everyone to have a great rest of your Monday. Thank you for attending and we will definitely be in touch. David, thank you so much for um, presenting today. It was a very informative uh, session, appreciate it. Have a great thank you day, for everybody. inviting me and thank, thank everyone you. for showing up. Absolutely. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.